Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multi-dimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 160 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 25 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and my mistakes. I've got a great show for you today. I'm going to talk about some recent experiences I've had running D&D and specifically running the Hidden Shrine of Tomawakan. And I'm going to talk about some changes that I've made to the adventure and why. So a lot of us out there run published adventures, if not all the time, at least from time to time. And part of the art of running a published adventure is making the adventure your own. So I thought it might be illuminating to talk about an adventure I'm running right now and talk about some of the changes I'm making to it and what my reasons are for making those changes and how exactly I'm going about it. But before I get into that, I have a couple announcements. I want to remind you that you can watch me run the Hidden Shrine of Tomahawk and on my YouTube channel. I stream that live every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And all of the previous sessions are on the YouTube channel. So even if you can't watch it live, you can watch it anytime on my YouTube channel. You can also head to starwalkerstudios.com and check out my adventure that I wrote and published for Dungeons and Dragons called The Trickster's Labyrinth. And I recently did an episode all about The Trickster's Labyrinth and answering some listener questions about it. So I think I've said enough about it recently. Uh, If you wanna know more about it, you can go check out that episode. All right, so I think that will do it for the announcements today, and uh, we can move forward with the show and talk about some of my recent experiences running D&D. So one comment that I've gotten from a listener about the show is, that they wished I would spend more time giving personal anecdotes from my games that I run and play. So I asked for feedback on that in an earlier episode about what exactly people want to hear as far as personal anecdotes. And I'm still waiting to hear back from you on that. So if you have any thoughts on that, shoot me an email, gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. But until I hear something specific, I, I did want to try to do this in the show, if this is something people want to hear. I did a review of Tales from the Awning Portal, and I read through the book uh, actually two or three times before I did that review. And I think I did a pretty good review. But now that I've started running The Hidden Shrine of Tomawakin, of course, I've discovered things about it that I didn't know when I did the review, because it's one thing to read a thing even a few times. It's another thing to actually run an adventure. And, um, you know, I would if I could do the review over, I would add some things that I've learned by running the adventure. And one thing that I've learned is that there's not enough XP in this adventure to get you to the next adventure. In the beginning of Tales from the Awning Portal, it suggests that you could put these adventures together in a campaign if you want. And that each of the adventures will give you enough XP to get the PCs to the next adventure. At least in the case of Hidden Shrine, this just simply isn't true. The Hidden Shrine is an adventure for level five characters. The next adventure in the book is White Plume Mountain, which is an adventure for level eight characters. And there is no way there's enough XP in Hidden Shrine to get a group of four or five player characters to level eight. In fact, there's barely enough to get them to level six. And especially if you have a group of five players, which the adventure is recommended for four to five players. If you have a group of five players, you're going to have to add quite a few random encounters to get them, 
even the level six, much rather level eight. Now, someone, I think it was on YouTube, but, but someone pointed out that, well, are you adding XP for role playing or story rewards and blah, 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 blah. And no, I'm not. I'm just counting the encounter XP, but adding XP for those kinds of things is, is an optional rule. It's not assumed in one of these adventures that you're going to hand out XP for that kind of stuff. Now, you definitely can, and there's nothing wrong with it, and, and I have been. But just going by the encounters, there's not enough to get them to level six. And even if you're very generous with role-playing experience and all that stuff, even if the PCs can earn as much or more experience from role-playing and things like that as they do from the actual encounters, you're still not going to have enough to get to level eight. So that's one criticism I have of the adventure. The other criticism, kind of a part of that, is it's a dungeon. It's super long. We've played six sessions now. We only play three hours a session, but that's, what, 18 hours? It's probably more like 20 because we usually go over at least a little bit. So 18 to 20 hours of play, and we're maybe just over halfway through the dungeon. So it's a really long dungeon, and if you want to be anywhere near um, Wizard's recommendation, which they recommend to get from 5th fifth, fifth to 6th level should take two to three, four-hour sessions, it's going to take way more than that. I'm guessing it will take us, let's make the math easy, let's say it takes us 12 sessions, slightly less than 12 if, if they were four-hour, because we do three-hour, but still way more than two or three, right? So, so they should have leveled a, a couple, two or three times in that amount of time. And to play that long of a dungeon and only level once at the very end, I think, I mean, there are players that would be into, into it. It'd be kind of old school. You know, you have to play for three months to gain one level. But I, I don't want to do that, especially at fifth level. Now, you know, if you're talking really high level, like 15th level plus, then, yeah, I think playing for months to gain one level is is fine because at that point, you know, I mean, you kind of have to slow things down if you want to keep playing those characters. But at fifth level, yeah, I that's way too much. So part of the problem is there's just not enough XP and the PCs are only going to level once through this entire dungeon. Also, um, I don't think the lack of XP is an oversight because looking at the encounters in the dungeon, they all seem to be designed for about fifth level characters. So, you know, right away I, I was like, well, I, I really, I don't want to go through two or three months of playing this and they only gain one level. So I want them to actually get to at least seventh level, if not eighth. But if I do that, as soon as I level them to level six, all the encounters after that are going to be super easy. And another criticism of this dungeon is a lot of the encounters are super easy, even if the PCs are fifth level. Now, anybody watching that watches my YouTube might say, Lex, you've got a lot of players. And, and that's true. And I'm, I'm factoring that in. But even if I only had four players, and keep in mind, the adventure is designed for four to five. So it should be able to handle five. Even if I have four players, the encounters are, are crazy easy. There's a handful of encounters in the entire dungeon that are fairly challenging as written and the rest of them are pretty much a face roll. Now there's, you know, there's more to it. One of the elements of this dungeon is there is a mechanic in place that discourages resting. Although uh, if you have player characters with access to uh, certain kinds of magic then it, it can be gotten around and, and my group has figured out how to get around it. Um, although, interestingly, the character that can cast the spell that can get them around it, which is the wizard, doesn't always prepare that spell. So they could get around it all the time, but they don't because he doesn't always prepare that spell. I'm not sure why, but I mean, that's his character. He plays the character how, how he wants. So um, anyway... <laughs> There's this mechanic that discourages resting. It can be gotten around, um, but there's, you know, a few fairly specific ways you could get around it and maybe something else creative the players uh, could come up with. So it's possible that the players could get around this mechanic, but it's also possible, depending on the party makeup and what they have access to, that, that a given party wouldn't have any way to get around it. 
So part of the design of this dungeon, I think, is, yeah, a lot of these encounters aren't super challenging, but because the player characters can't rest, you know, they, they only have so many hit points, right? You know, and even super easy encounters um, are going to wear them down over time because even if they only lose a few hit points, well, if they don't have a way to get them back, if they're out of hit dice or whatever, then that still matters as that accumulates over time. And I get that. And I truly believe that that's a, a part of the design of the dungeon. Unfortunately, that's not a super fun way to play, right? This slow attrition of resources uh, is not very fun. So, you know, we got these problems. We got, um, there's not enough XP to get the player characters where I want them to be level wise. Uh, there, a lot of the encounters are face roll easy. And especially if I start leveling the characters during the dungeon, they're going to be even more face roll easy. And the kind of shtick of the dungeon is slowly wearing them down over time, which for one, isn't super fun and satisfying. And for two, if the player characters can get around the little thing that presents them, prevents them from resting, which mine can, that goes out the window anyway. So these are all problems that, that kind of go in together and something that, that I wanted to, to address because, again, this is a really long dungeon and the last thing I want is for it to become, become a slog or a grind and get to the point where the players are like, I don't want to do this dungeon anymore. And maybe they just quit showing up or they don't want to play anymore or they're just not into it and they're just wanting to get through this dungeon. And I'm the kind of DM that if we got to that point, I would just, well, I would ask the players and, and if people would just were just fed up. We'd just quit playing. But um, if people weren't completely fed up with playing, I would probably just be like, okay, we're not going to finish this dungeon. We're going to go on to something else because nobody's having fun. So I want to avoid that happening. I want to head that off at the pass. So I decided to do a couple things. First of all, I decided to award XP for things like traps and um, just role playing and also setting up what I feel to be some kind of story milestones in the dungeon, which again are all going to be encounters because it's a dungeon. So they're already getting XP for the encounter, but giving them additional XP because I've decided, well, this is an important milestone of the dungeon. So they're going to get more XP on top of that. So that was one thing I did. And then, you know, remember, if I'm going to level them more then we we've exacerbated the problem of it not being challenging enough. So another thing I did is I've tooled up some of the encounters, not all of them, because I do agree that not every encounter should be super challenging. You know, sometimes they, they should encounter something easy that they can just bulldoze through and, you know, just to have variety and, and just have change of pace. And also so occasionally the player characters can feel and the players can feel like, hey, we're badasses and not always feel like they're getting their butts kicked. So I've increased the difficulty of some of the encounters, but not all of them. And I've just changed some of the encounters because some of the encounters are so easy. It's just ridiculous. It's like, why is this even here? Why are we going to waste time with this encounter? It's pointless. So I'm going to talk about one particular encounter. And I ran this yesterday. So and, and I'm a few weeks ahead in or I think a week ahead at this point in my production of the show. So my players will have already experienced this when I talk about it. And so it won't be a spoiler to my players now, if you're playing Hidden Shrine, this could be a, well, this would be somewhat of, an, of a spoiler for one of the encounters. But the only thing I'm going to spoil about the encounter is tell you what the monster is. So if you're playing this or you think you might play it, the extent of the spoilers today is I'm going to let out of the bag one monster that you will face in this dungeon. And that's if your DM doesn't change it which I think there's a good chance that your DM is going to change it like I did, unless your DM doesn't prepare and isn't planning ahead and is just trying to run it out of the box. And then they might not because they might not have time to realize, oh, this encounter is really dumb. <laughs> but I think if, if your DM is is prepared for, 
for class, I think there's a good chance your DM is going to change this anyway. So, you know, if, if you're worried about the spoiler, maybe skip ahead to the next segment of the show. But like I said, the only thing I'm going to spoil is one monster that you're going to face. And it's just going to be what that monster is because our discussion is going to be what I did instead because I did not run this encounter as written. So the monster is a gas spore. We're past the spoiler now. So a gas spore, if you want to look it up in your monster manual, or if you don't, I'll give you the relevant information, is a CR one half monster. Okay, level five party, four to five level five characters against one CR one half monster. This would not be a challenging encounter for a first level party. In fact, I've thrown one of these things at a first level party before, and they only had or no, they had four characters at the time. So this monster is a gas spore. Things to know about it, it has one hit point. Armor class of five. Armor class of five. <laughs> that means your average first level character with a plus two proficiency bonus and let's say a plus two main attribute bonus, which probably they'd have a three, but let's say they only have two. So a total bonus of plus four uh, could hit this if they roll, as long as they don't roll a one. That's a first level character without like optimized <laughs> abilities. Um, could hit this as long as they don't roll a one. A first level character with no ability bonus, with just their proficiency bonus, could hit it if they roll a three. Not hard to hit. Has only one hit point. Has 1d10 hit die minus four hit points. So even if you did max hit points, it'd only have six. So you're going to hit it. You're going to kill it in one hit. As far as attacks, it has a touch attack with a zero attack bonus. It does one poison damage. That's it. And then there's a DC 10 con save or become diseased. Now, the only thing that makes this not a waste of paper, this monster the only thing remotely dangerous about it is the disease. So if it manages to hit you with its zero attack bonus and do its one damage, you get a DC 10 save or you get the disease. So even if you're a first level character, you got no bonuses to your con saving throw. You got a 50-50 chance of making the saving throw. Um, also, when it dies, it does a death burst. It explodes Everybody within a 20 foot radius has to make a DC 15 constitution saving throw. So that's a little harder or take 3d6 poison damage for an average of 10 damage. Now for a first level party, that can be fairly, fairly dangerous. It's probably not going to kill anybody, but it could knock some people out 10 damage. And also if they fail to save, not only do they take the damage, but they become infected by the disease. Now, the disease is really the only thing about this that's dangerous for anything beyond uh, first level. And the disease uh, kills the creature in a number of hours equal to 1d12 plus the creature's constitution score unless the disease is removed. And then when the creature dies from this, it releases 2d4 gas spores that grow to full size in seven days. So really the one dangerous thing about this is when you kill it, it explodes. It does a little damage unless you're first level, then it's a lot of damage. Um, you get a DC 15 con saving throw. If you fail, you take that damage and then in one D 12 plus your constitution score hours, you die. So the only way this is, really dangerous is if you have no access to a some kind of cure disease spell or or whatever like res, lesser restoration so that's a second level spell lesser restoration so a first or a second level character or party isn't going to have access to lesser restoration also paladins get the ability to cure disease because a paladin can use lay on hands to cure a disease by using five hit points of their lay on hands and they can lay on hands a number of hit points equal to five times their level, their paladin level. So a first level paladin who has not used any of their lay on hands could cure that disease. But first or second level party, unless they have a paladin 
or there there might be some other class or, or subclass that gets the the special ability to remove a disease. But unless they have that, they're not going to be able to remove a disease or a magic item. Kyotum's ointment, for instance, will remove a disease. Uh, I believe there's a, a potion that, that will cure a disease. So this can be bad, even uh, like kill characters at first or second level um, because they won't have access to lesser restoration. If they don't have a paladin or a magic item or something like that, they, they don't have within the party any way to cure that disease and those characters would just die. Now, of course, they could have an NPC either cast lesser restoration on them or they they could maybe uh, get a, a, a cure disease potion or, or some Kyotum's ointment from a temple or something like that. And, and I would hope if, if you're the DM running this game and these characters get diseased, you know, that you'd at least give them some way to, to get around it, um, have an NPC cast it. I mean, they're going to have to pay them, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, once your party is third level, as long as you have a cleric or a bard in the party, they're going to have access to lesser restoration. Well, if it's a bard, they might not if they didn't choose that as a known spell. But if they have a cleric, they'll definitely have access to lesser restoration. If they have a paladin, the paladin can lay on hands. So really, you know, after the first few levels of play, this monster kind of becomes just an annoyance. It's not going to do any damage, really. The only thing deadly about it is the disease. And as a party gets higher and higher level, that becomes not deadly and just an inconvenience unless they're just all fighters or something and, and they don't have nobody has less restoration or they don't have any magic items for that. Then, then it could, you know, it could still be rough at higher levels. Um, but eventually it's not even an inconvenience. It's just an annoyance because it's like, oh, now we got a long rest. So the cleric can prepare less restoration because they didn't prepare it, you know. Or, or we have to use this potion or whatever. So, I mean, once a party is, say, fifth level, like the level you're supposed to be for this adventure, uh, just the disease isn't of its in and of itself really a threat. It's just going to be an inconvenience. Now, again, part of this is they, they don't they can't rest freely and and basically they're taking damage every hour. So, you know, if you're in a situation where the party has lesser restoration, but no one prepared it, now they have to take a long rest to prepare it. They're going to take that damage. But again, it's just going to be an annoyance. It's going to be a, a slow attrition of resources, none of which is super fun. And all this for an encounter that's going to last literally one act. It's not even going to last a round. The first character that attacks it is going to kill it. Because it's got armor class 5 and it's got one hit point. So it's like, why even roll initiative for this? It'd be easier just to DM Fiat and say, hey, there's poison gas. Everybody make this safe for this disease. You know what I'm saying? Like, why even bother with a monster at that point? So I wasn't very satisfied with this encounter. And I'm like, here's a golden opportunity that I can take what would be a waste of time, annoying encounter and make it something more fun, make it something that will actually be challenging and scary, and at the same time, add some XP into the adventure and, you know, kind of kill two birds with one stone kind of thing. This is Matthew Colville, and you're listening to Game Master's Journey. I want to take a minute to give a quick shout out to the patrons of Starwalker Studios. The support of the patrons makes this show possible. If you enjoy Game Master's Journey and you'd like to give a little back, becoming a patron is a great way to do so. It's because of the patrons that all the listeners of Game Master's Journey enjoy a bonus episode every month. I'd also like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my tier four patron, Mr. Steve Strickland. Let's hear it for Steve. The man. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you to all the patrons. You can find out more about becoming a patron by clicking on the Patreon button at the top of the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com. Now, of course, I could have replaced this with 
anything I wanted, right? So I wanted to replace it with something that would make sense in the dungeon, something that would fit in the dungeon. That was my first thing I thought about. So they've encountered, um, they've encountered a lot of like animals. They've encountered a lot of sort of constructs. Uh, so, so I was thinking, well, you know, looking for, for monsters that would fit in the dungeon. And then I was also thinking about maybe I could find a monster that is similar to this in some way, but is just more, uh, more interesting and more of a threat. So the gas spore is this floating ball. And I even had, you know, the read aloud description of it, which describes it as this floating ball with these like tentacles, with these white orbs with black dots on them that kind of look like eyes. So of course, right? The obvious right away, I thought, hey, maybe it's a beholder. Like it kind of sounds like a beholder, right? Maybe I could just use a beholder instead. Well, beholders are like, pretty high CR for the party, but I knew that there's a lot of like beholder variants, like beholder kin and things like that. There's even more in Volo's guide. So I started looking around through the, through the monster manual and through Volo's guide and another uh, type of monster that they encounter a lot in this dungeon is undead. And then I thought, you know, I'm pretty sure there's some kind of undead beholder. So sure enough, there's an, a beholder zombie which I believe is a CR5. So I was like, well, that's about the right CR. It's way cooler than um, this stupid gas spore. I can use the exact same description. And I did. I described it using the description they gave for the gas spore because that could easily have been the description for a beholder zombie. And I just use a zombie Beholder zombie instead of the gas spore. I was able to do the encounter exactly the same way, you know, same setup, same description, everything. The only thing I changed was the stats of the monster I used. Well, there's one other thing I changed because even looking at the beholder zombie as a CR five against a party of five or six, six level now, because they've leveled at this point, six level characters um, wouldn't have been much of a threat. And and I could have easily seen it getting killed before it even got a chance to, to attack or do anything. Um, and, and I wanted it to be like, kind of like a boss fight because the way of the, the flow of this adventure has been going, it's been a while since they've had a, a challenging encounter. It's been at least a couple sessions since they've had an encounter that was really challenging. They've had quite a few easy encounters and some traps and puzzles and stuff like that. But it's been a while since they've had a really challenging encounter. So I thought as far as the pacing of the adventure overall, we were we were due for something a little more challenging. And, and I wanted to do something fun. So basically what I did was I took the Beholder Zombie, used it as written, except I made a legendary version of it. The only thing I changed was I gave it maximum hit points, so I just gave it the maximum hit points it could have. I gave it uh, legendary resistance. I gave it, I think, two per day, which actually never came into play because the character never used an ability or a spell against it that required a saving throw. Um, or no, there was one, but it succeeded on the roll. I rolled a, t a natural 20 on the saving throw, so I didn't need to use legendary resistance. And then I gave it legendary actions. I gave it the ability to take three legendary actions per turn at the end of player's character's turns, or I should say three legendary actions per round at the end of a player character's turn. And the legendary actions it could take was it could move its speed, it could make a bite attack, or it could make one of its eye ray attacks. Now, the only one of those, of course, that had ever used was the eye ray. And a beholder zombie is like a watered down version of a beholder. It only has four different rays it can do. But just like the beholder, you roll a die to randomly determine which ray it uses. And, and that's all I did. And I, I figured the, I refigured the CR and I think it came out to a CR 10, uh, with the adjustments I made of, of adding the hit points and giving it the legendary actions came out to about a CR 10 
uh, which, you know, was actually slightly higher. I, I ended up only having five players last night was slightly, I, I think the um, unearthed arcana encounter building guidelines, which is what I tend to use these days. Uh, and then I kind of check it with the DMG guidelines. I think the encounter building guidelines uh, in the unearthed arcana recommended for five level six characters facing a CR nine legendary monster. And this was CR 10, but um, I was like, ah, close enough. What the hell? And it, it was fine. I mean, it was definitely uh, touch and go there, uh, mainly because of the disintegration ray. Um, the, the rest of the stuff, um, it had a, a fear ray, which I think affected one or two characters. So um, took them out of the fight for like a round. I don't think a, a character was frightened for more than a single round because um, the saving throw DC was fairly low. It was only like DC 14 saving throw, which at sixth level isn't isn't that bad. So the fear ray was kind of just annoying. Uh, most of the time it didn't even work. Uh, it had, uh, I think it was Enervation Ray, which did hit one of the characters and did some damage. And I mean, it was definitely like a depletion of resources, but it wasn't like it was going to kill that character. But the Eye Ray did like, I don't remember, like 8D10 or something. It was a lot. Luckily for the player characters, uh, it used the, and I was rolling randomly to see which ray it used. It used the Eye Ray, the Disintegration Ray, I think three times three or four times and the characters that were targeted by that made the uh reflex or reflex made the dexterity save to avoid the ray every time but one and the player that or the player character that failed the one time was actually steve our, our tier four patron or actually tier five patron now steve his character failed the save and i actually rolled the damage <laughs> And saw that I was doing the, uh, it was the exact amount of damage that he had hit points, which if you know anything about disintegration, if it takes you to zero, you're disintegrated. And I think, I'm not even sure that resurrection can work at that point because there's nothing left but some some ash or some dust. So I saw that was going to happen. And I'd already asked Steve when he failed to save, I was, before I even rolled damage, I'm like, oh, this is a lot of damage and it's disintegration, which is scary. I'm like, do you have inspiration so you can, you know, roll another 20? And he didn't. So when, when I rolled uh, the damage and I saw it was going to be the end of his character, I then asked the party, I was like, hey, before I resolve this, does anyone else have inspiration that they want to spend um, so that... Steve can roll another another d20 on the saving throw. And uh, one of the characters, the, the player that plays the, the warlock, uh, her character had inspiration. So she spent that so that he could re-roll and then, and then he made the save. I mean, he was a, he's an elf wizard, so he's got a pretty good dexterity bonus. So, um, yeah, that was close. So, so, yeah, really the only damage I think anyone took in that encounter was the monk got hit by the innervation ray and took like 30 damage or something like that from that. Um, but, I mean, this disintegration ray was flying around and everybody knew that Steve's character was was one roll away from from dying uh, because of it being disintegrated. So, so it was a pretty, I think, pretty dramatic encounter. I mean, the players were were worried and yeah, it played out a lot better and was a lot more fun than if I'd just thrown a gas spore at him because yeah, that disease would have been nothing. In fact, they have one of the characters has Keodum's ointment, so they could have just used one use of that and that'd have been the end of the disease on anybody who was diseased. So it would have been other than to get rid of their uses of the ointment, it would have been pointless. So, and at sixth level, I'm not really worried about them having that ointment. <laughs> So yeah, so so that's how I changed it and and why, and it worked it worked really well. I mean, I almost had a character die, but I was you know I was super nice about it. I as a rule, I use this as an optional rule in the DMG, but I as a rule allow inspiration use to be declared after the roll is made, but before I announce the results. So by the book, the 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 stock rule as written for inspiration is before you roll the D20, you have to say you're using inspiration and then you make the roll with advantage. You get to roll two, two D20s and, and take the better 
result. However, I use the optional rule, which is in the DMG, which says that you can declare you use inspiration after you make the roll, but before the DM tells you if you succeed or fail. And the reason I, and I do that is because I don't like the idea of a player using inspiration and then they didn't need it. Because let's say the player has a red die and a blue die and they always use the red die and they say the blue die is my inspiration die and they roll the two dice and the red die, they roll a 20, right? That's going to be a feel bad moment for the player and really for the group because I see inspiration as a group resource because you can use inspiration on someone else's role or you can I think actually you can give your inspiration to someone else, but I let people use it for, for someone else as, as well. You can do either. You can just say, Hey, you know, I'm going to give Steve's character my inspiration or when Steve's character makes a roll and he rolls terrible, you can say, I'm going to spend my inspiration for Steve's character. I, I let them do either. And if you play Numenera, this is very similar to how XP use works in Numenera. And I just like it because it's more of a team uh, dynamic. You know, it's inspiration is a team resource that the players use as a team to help each other out. And I, I really like that dynamic. So, again, the reason that I let them roll at or say they use inspiration after they roll is to avoid that that case where the, the player character rolls a 20 on their regular die. And they're like, oh, I just completely wasted that inspiration because I would have succeeded without it. And um I don't always remember to hand out inspiration. So it's a very limited resource anyway. So I want it when they use it, I want it to mean something or I at least want, I mean, it won't always mean that you succeed, right? You could roll two 20 sided and they're both ones, right? But I want it. I don't want them to use it in a time when they didn't need it kind of thing. Cause, cause I think inspiration is that moment where, you know, you can possibly succeed where you would have failed because you're a hero or because you're blessed by the gods or, or whatever the story reason is that you have inspiration. And, and so that's the way I do it. And, you know, in this particular case, I, I was especially nice because even after I rolled the damage, I hadn't told them what it was yet. Or maybe I did. Yeah, I think I did. I think I told them it was 50 damage and I saw Steve had 50 hit points. And, um, you know, I didn't have to let them still use inspiration at that point, but I have a lot of, uh, newer players in my group. And I know that players just in general tend to forget about inspiration, even more experienced players, because it's something new in D and D. So I sometimes will remind players and be like, Hey, does anybody have inspiration they want to spend? So, yeah, I mean, that was awesome. And I'm fine with it because uh, now they don't have inspiration. I think I think uh, Phoebe's character, the, the warlock, was the only one who had inspiration. So now the party doesn't have any inspiration until someone else does something cool. So until then, they're kind of, you know, they're at my mercy. So, um, you know, I as a as a GM, you know, this is kind of an aside but I, I know some people will disagree with this and they're in the, they'll say, Oh, Lex, you're being too easy on your players. And I will, well, let, let me see how I would say this to me. I don't see this as quote cheating or even fudging. I mean, I rolled 50 damage. I didn't change what I rolled. Um, I was just a little friendly to the characters cause I let them use a resource a little bit later than maybe I normally would have. But I mean, I'm the GM. That's my call, right? I can do whatever the hell I want. I don't have to explain myself. <laughs> but I am explaining myself because that's the point of the show is, is for us to learn um, from, from all of our experiences. So the reason I do this is I think about it this way. And, and I've had this experience in 5th edition, and that's why I know to do this, is what if, what if I wouldn't have done that I would have said, Steve, you take 50 damage. He's like, I only have 50 hit points. I'm at zero. I'm unconscious. And I say, no, actually, you're not because this is disintegration. And if it takes you to zero, your character is disintegrated, which I mean, I'm not going to look it up right now, but I think maybe even resurrection 
uh, wouldn't bring you back at that point. But even if it does, they don't have resurrection. They're not that high enough level. So they'd have to go find an NPC to cast that, which is would not be possible right now. They'd have to wait until they're done with this dungeon. So Steve would have to make a new character for the rest of this adventure, which is probably going to be at least another month of real world time, um, which at this point, I mean, he's probably just going to play the new character, right? So, so basically be the end of Steve's character. So how would I feel and how would everybody else at the table feel if that happened? And then later in the session or later that week or the next week when we were playing, Phoebe, the player of the warlock, was like, oh, crap, guys. I just realized I have inspiration. Last week when Steve's character died (laughs) and he failed that saving throw and we all knew it was bad, they knew it was they the, the characters might not have known it was disintegration per se, But they knew, well, they basically knew what it was because I was describing when people were making their saving throws and it was missing them, it was disintegrating the stone of the chamber and carving these perfect tubes (laughs) into the chamber. So they might not have known that is the effect, quote, disintegration, but they knew it was disintegrating things. They knew that getting hit by that was probably the end for them, right? I mean, the way I described it it was pretty obvious. I, I was basically telegraphing hey you don't want to get hit by this because it's carving through stone like it's nothing so think what it's going to do to your character kind of thing and of course any players that know anything (laughs) knew a this is some kind of beholder and b that's disintegration so so the players knew what was going on the characters knew what was going on everybody knew what was going on so how would have everybody felt if the next week phoebe was like hey i had inspiration when steve failed that save, I should have used it because I could have used it at that moment. Steve could have re-rolled and maybe he would have succeeded. Maybe his character wouldn't have been disintegrated. Maybe Steve would still be playing Ash right now instead of this new character he made. And, you know, maybe Steve would have been like, ah, no problem. I don't care. Which is kind of how Steve was afterwards. He's like, ah, if if my character would have died, I would have just made another one. It's no big deal. But Phoebe might have still felt bad, right? She might have felt like, man, I really screwed up. You know, I I screwed up. I had something I could have used that would have helped the team and I forgot it or or whatever. And I mean, maybe Phoebe would have felt that way. Maybe not. I don't know. I, I can't get in her head, but I can guarantee you I would have felt bad because I would have felt I screwed up as a GM because that's not how I roll. And I would have been like, you know what? I should have asked <laughs> after... When Steve rolled a really bad roll on his dexterity save, it wasn't like he was unsure whether he succeeded or not. He rolled like an eight, like a total of eight on on the save. So we all knew he failed before I told him. I would have felt like I should have at that point said, hey, does anybody have inspiration? Because, for instance, Phoebe is a fairly new player. I have other players in the group that are fairly new players and may not remember. And part of my job, I feel, as a GM is to help out newer, less experienced players. And, and you know, I'm not trying to get them in gotcha moments. Like, I'm on the player's side. I'm, you know, if they fairly lose by the rules, then, then I'll let them lose. But I'm there to facilitate everybody having a good time. And I'm on the player's side. And if I can help them within the rules, then, then I will. So I know I would have felt bad because that's happened before in other campaigns. I don't know if it led to a character death, but there's been times when something really bad happened and then later people realize, oh, I had inspiration. I could have done something. And I felt bad because I was like, you know, I probably should have asked because I know I have newer players. I know that players just in general tend to completely forget about inspiration. And it's just a feel bad moment for the group overall to later realize that you had this resource you could have used that your character would have used that you should have used, but you didn't just because you forgot you had it. So I've had that happen more than one time in the past with fifth edition and I don't like it. And I really hate to retcon something that happened a week ago, though I will, if I feel I have to, or I feel it's for the best of the game or the group. So I'm glad that, I did what I did and you know, I, my only, my only uh, fear or, or the only possible downside is if the players think 
that this means I won't let them die because I will. Um, so that would be bad if I if I sent the message of, oh, we don't have to worry if my character's going to die. Lex won't let it happen. And then in the future, when someone's character dies, they're mad at me because I've like, you know, I'm, I'm not being uh, consistent. I'm not being predictable. Right. Or or even worse, they think that I'm showing favorites. It's like, oh, well, they won't let Steve's character. Lex won't let Steve's character die, but he'll let Phoebe's character die. Right. Um, so so that would be the only possible downside. Uh, so I just have to be careful, you know, and, and be consistent, which is, you know, a good reason as a GM to to be consistent. So, yeah, there's a little war story from my game I'm running and kind of something I've changed about this adventure I'm running and why I changed it. And also, as a bonus, a little discussion on how I do inspiration and how I approach a a moment that something really bad is going to happen to a player character. I will usually, if I feel like there's something the players or the characters can do, and I think... They're just not thinking of it for some reason, but I think it's something that they should be thinking of or that they would be thinking of. I will remind them like, hey, you can use inspiration or something like that, especially when I have newer players. Now, as a campaign goes on and as characters get higher level, I do that less and less. So a perfect example of that is my Tyranny of Dragons campaign. That was, I think, the first thing I ran in 5th edition. A lot of my players had never played 5th edition so in the beginning of that, I was very forgiving and, and I would let people redeclare actions or change what they said. And, and I was just very lean, lenient. I even let people change their characters. I used the, uh, uh, the, what's it called? The organized play rule where you have until like fourth level, I think, to completely re- rebuild your character if you want. I let them do that just because we were all new to the game. But there came, it came a point when they were like eighth level or whatever that was like, okay, guys, you guys have been playing long enough. You've been playing these characters long enough that, you know, the gloves are coming off, the training wheels are coming off, and, and I'm not going to help you as much. And I told them that, right? Because, again, I think as a GM, being consistent is really important. And you want to set precedents and then live up to them so your players know what to expect from you. And if you're going to change the rules on them, you owe it to your players to tell them, which, again, you can change the rules. And you should if you need to, but just communicate that. So I I told the players, I was like, hey, you know, from now on, I'm not going to help you as much. You know, when you say you do something in combat, that's what you did. When you say you say something in a conversation, that's what you said. You can't change it. And if I see you doing something uh, stupid (laughs) or less than optimal or whatever, I'm probably not going to tell you anymore, you know, where before I would tell you if I felt like you were making a mistake because you didn't understand the rules or you were forgetting something your character could do. I I might have told you, hey, wait, are you sure you want to do that? But I'm not doing that anymore because you guys have been doing this long enough that if you're paying attention and you're trying, you know, you should be beyond the point where you need that from me. And now I expect more from you. But I, I communicated that so everybody knew and and everybody was cool. Like everybody was ready for that. They're like, yeah, cool. You know, we're ready. You know, we we want more of a challenge now. And yeah, so so I think it's important to be consistent, but don't let that be like a straitjacket. Just, you know, if you need to change your approach to something, whether it's a house rule that you want to change or get rid of or how you approach metagaming or or whatever, you can do it even in the middle of a campaign, in the middle of an adventure, in the middle of an encounter, if you have to. You can do it. Just communicate with your players, explain what you're doing and why, and it shouldn't be a problem. Well, that's going to wrap it up for episode 160. If you would like to get a hold of me, please visit the website starwalkerstudios.com. There you can email me, find my Twitter, Google+, Facebook, Pinterest, and YouTube information, and the Game Master's Journey voicemail number where you can call and leave me a message. If your question or feedback is enlightening or entertaining or both, you might even hear your message on the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future topics, I would love to hear from you. 
You can also find a link to the Game Master's Journey community where you can share ideas with other listener GMs. Finally, you can learn about how you can support the show by becoming a patron, by making a one-time donation, by using my Amazon referral link when you shop on Amazon, or by purchasing my D&D adventure, The Trickster's Labyrinth. You can find all this and more at StarWalkerStudios.com. I hope you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week. I hope you have a chance to run your favorite RPG. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. 